I was just thinking, this is based on a carpool karaoke, right? It's well, actually, act, well, no, the inspiration was uh, comedians in a car get coffee. Oh, was it? I yeah. haven't seen that. Because I was thinking, oh, come on, we got to sing if it's carpool karaoke. Well, if you want to sing, <laughs> have at her. I'll, no, I'll no, it's got to be a duet. I'll be a backup. I'll, I'll only do a duet, uh, yeah. What, what song do you want to do? <laughs> You know what? That's the thing. Generationally, I don't even know if we could come up with one. <laughs> yeah, never mind. I'm not going to say anything. Uh, okay, so back with another episode of I'm in a Car. Um, I have the honor of having Gail Green part of this, so thank you very much for doing the show, Gail. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's been a long time coming to get, yeah. to get you on here. We're going to go over some entrepreneur stuff. We're going to go over some leadership stuff. One of the things I usually do at the beginning of videos, I've done a couple, is uh, intrigue's purpose, empowering leaders to strengthen communities is one of the reasons, also the inspiration for these videos. Um, really, we're just trying to give people, you know, share experiences, lessons we've learned, mistakes we've made, wins we've had, so that we can kind of spread the word and give other people the opportunity to move a little bit faster and, and grow a little bit bigger. So thank you for being a part of it. Oh, I love it. I think it's great. Cool. So, yeah. uh, quick rundown. You want to give us a little summary of kind of where you've come from and what you're up to? Well, you know, um, so I come from a very small community in rural Newfoundland. Did you know that about me? Yeah, I did. I didn't realize that there wasn't a rural Newfoundland. I didn't know there was urban Newfoundland. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, St. John's is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Enough, but, yeah. hey, Rob, come on. There's a sign when you leave the Trans-Canada saying, make sure your gas tank is full. There's right. no gas tank for 133 kilometers. We're not talking about your normal rule. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's cool. Wow. I, know. Yeah, I knew Newfoundland. Know. I didn't know how rural it was, though. You know, well, it depends, right? So from the, you know, from the, the tiny places on the south coast that, you know, my, my high, uh, there was only 44 people in my graduating class. Um, that was a combination of three communities coming together wow. in one school, you know. Um, so anyway, but I, I went to university. Where? Um, at Memorial in St. John's. Okay, and then, yeah, okay, cool. And then I, I got a job teaching on the south coast. Um, the coast that I grew up on, but because I was the last in first out cutbacks in the early nineties, right. I was, you know, kind of out just because of my age and seniority. And my sister was going to Nova Scotia and she said, well, I'm going to Nova Scotia. Why don't you come? I said, okay, have at her. Let's do it. I packed up my car, the Mercury Tracer that had lost the T we called the racer. Yes. And we moved to Nova Scotia. Mercury Tracer, what a what a sweet ride. <laughs> right, and the tea had fallen off, so we used to call it the racer. That's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, we got there, and I, I couldn't find a job teaching, so I ended up selling insurance and was quite good at it. But, you know, how everything in your life happens for a reason. And it was a combination of my sales experience and doing well in that. Although I couldn't stay in that industry, it wasn't right for me. And my teaching background that landed me the job with Franklin Cup right, right. in Ontario. Cool. So then I packed up now Honda Prelude. <laughs> oh, fancy! Ooh. That's sweet. And we were off to Ontario, baby. Yeah, yeah. Or I was off to Ontario to start a job around this leadership piece, specifically with education. And so I spent 16 years with that organization around leadership, individual effectiveness, team development. Yeah, and it's, there's some really cool models in Franklin County, right? Oh, absolutely. World-class content. I mean, I will be forever grateful for my time there because when I think about, you know, say, little Gail Green coming from rural Newfoundland, Stephen Covey says um, leadership is communicating somebody's worth and potential so clearly that they are inspired to see it in themselves. So, you know, if you come there with some talent and skills, you have these people who help nurture you. So you get exposure to this intellectual property yeah. and world class. And they also, um, we weren't perfect, but, but I do feel grateful for what they inspired in me. Cool. You know, but, but everything comes to an end. And, you know, um, there's a certain point in your life you go, well, you know what? I, maybe there's something else. And I couldn't have had that something else without that experience. But having had a successful career with there, it was time to move on and, and find something else. And I and, and I know you would want to talk about entrepreneurship. And, and really it was, okay, well, what's my next step? I didn't know. I, I didn't know. Oh, that's the other. I'm a little bit pack up and go. So, <laughs> I got uh, that sense. Yeah, yeah. So then we, my husband and I were talking and, and so with Franklin Kevy And I said, you know, they're going to divide the country now because of the growth. Should we stay here or should we go to Alberta? So we packed up the two boys. 
Let's go to Alberta. Let's go to Alberta. Sweet, party. Party. Alberta was great. We called our 18th month vacation. But interestingly enough, Rob, that's where I met Deanna Workland, who had bought the right to Emmer Genetics cool. for Canada. And I didn't know that's where I was going to land, but I knew it was time to start something new. And the day I resigned from Franklin Cup, the next day, the invitation to the first meeting of the minds in Canada landed in my inbox. Serendipity. Serendipitously. Serendipitously. So here wow. I am. I go. I go to her. I said, I've just resigned from Franklin Cubby, which she knew me from. I said, what's your vision for the country? She said, well, I don't want to be putting bums in seats across the country. I said, well, let's chat. And that's how I, that's how I carved out, you know, with those discussions with Deanna, we decided, okay, well, I wanted to come back to Ontario. This is where most of our friends so where you most know. of the people in the country live. Well, and my husband grew up here, and we were like, well, okay, if you're not there for the job, we should go back. So we carved out the rights for Ontario for Amber Genetics. Sweet. Yeah. So, it's you know, it's, um, you know, entrepreneurship, you've been down that road. I am down that road. Quite, yeah. quite far down that road. I know. But, you know, those first three to five years, Rob. Yeah. So that's what I wanted to just talk on that. So when you decided to start Emergenics Ontario and essentially jump off this cliff and move back to Ontario from Alberta. And, I mean, Emergenics is still a growing name. You know, yes. it's starting to become a bit more known. But, like, what was it, four years ago? Five It'll be years four, years years four years for, in Ontario in September. Right. So we're, okay. like, three and a half. Yeah. So, I mean, like, four years ago... No, Emerge of what? Yeah, no? exactly. So, like, you, you're essentially starting a business from scratch in Ontario. Mm-hmm. So, for all the people that are in entrepreneurship or thinking of starting their own business, what are some of the lessons you learned when it came to going from nothing and getting it going? Like, what are some of the things you learned and did? Well, okay. Where to start? There are so many things you do. Just a couple. <laughs> <laughs> we only have another 13 minutes. Okay. We have a leadership topic. Yeah, no, no. Um, really, <laughs> I, I do. Decide where you want to go and um, what you want to be in this, like a three to five year plan. So I put my plan together. And it's not like we follow that all the time, but know it. And then get yourself out there. Like, you know, I network my she off in the first years and, and find which audiences are the right ones and that doesn't mean I meet everybody in the room sometimes it's just one or two people sure. the other thing that um, you know we're, we're getting better at is that social media presence too is, is to really get out there with some good content that our people are looking and we're seeing our metrics go up on that but but find avenues to find who your client is and now be very strategic about where you put your name in front of cool so then going back to that and kind of being tactical in your experience uh, who did you define your target customer to be year one do you know at Ish. first it was um, I had started with um, you know associates like consultants that could be up there and have their own business right. as, as I grew I realized that um, I still want those associates to, to come back. It's not where I want to put um, my energy. My best client has been uh, small to medium businesses that really are, are in high growth mode, who want to um, define their culture. Like, you know, when I think about intrigue, you guys have done a masterful job with that. Thanks. And, um, and to your help, with your help, in a big yeah, way. Well, you know, and, and but you caught the vision, though. There were I, Look, there's lots of competition out there, Rob. Oh, yeah. and, and you saw how we delineated and how it really could build on an already great culture. So, the, so, so there's two pieces here. The, those are good, and they're good for our consultants, too. That's the kind of people that go out our associates, and they can target as well. Um, and then there's the larger businesses. But, but I tell you what I found is those keep the lights on. Right. So it's not that we don't pursue larger opportunities, and we have some really great ones brewing right now, but they take a long time. So it was finding the balance between going after the big ones, but still keeping the lights on. Yeah, that's cool. So then when it comes to networking tactically, when you said you networked your tushy off, uh, quote, mm. what what would you do? Like, where would you go? And then how would you, I mean, you're in a bit of a maybe privileged position. You don't have too much reluctance when it comes to putting your hand out and saying hi. Right. But there's still technique involved. You can't just go business card first. This is what I do. Buy it. 
do you know, I, I, I'm at the point now where I, the business card, I don't even care if I have them. Right. I would rather go to a networking event, have two good conversations, where by the end of it, we know each other, enough about each other's business. If there's a fit, we do exchange, or we don't. Right. Right? It's, it's um, so, you know, for people who, yes, I am quite comfortable going into those networking situations. For people who are not, I would tell them, don't work the room. It's not even an effective way. Go in, find one or two people that you're interested in. And uh, hey, if you don't have a connection, move on. It's all good. It's all good. Yeah. But but there's no need to hand out your business card to, uh, to a million people. Just So take the pressure off. You know, Just find one or two people to, to network with. And then now, Rob, there's a cycle. So we're almost at year four where there's less of that necessary and more people referring now. Wonderful. You know, so, so and that's a and it's a different relationship now because because you've been referred, somebody else trusts you. That means that new person already trusts you more automatically. Yeah. Now because it's a referral. Big time. Not a big, call. big time. That's cool. Yeah. So things are going well. They are. And you've been uh, growing Emergetics in Ontario and in in part in Canada, but you've also been looking at leadership, you know, across the board and cognitive diversity. Well, so I, I, you know, I was sharing with you, and I'll just share with the audience that I, I'm really intrigued by this whole diversity piece. And um, the first article, you met Hamlin Green. He's one of the Emergenetics Associates. Yeah, big time. Yeah, good dude. So he, he first sent me an article. It was Hamlin, and um, and it was, you know, it, it really talked about this cognitive diversity and then the first thing was like you know diversity as a whole which is really important and and one of the pieces my favorite piece in the article was that when they added women to teams and they researched it it collectively raised the IQ of the team cool. because women brought a new skill set they they picked up on more nuances maybe that their male counterparts didn't or just different so, perspective right it was different and and even the visible difference force people around the table to look at things differently and that's why cultural differences are so important as we get better at what we do and as we lead teams because we come with different perspectives and and then so as I get deeper and and you know we have our respecting differences and things like that I read this case study which was so intriguing about these this research study in 2009 with college students where they put them homogeneously in teams by furor at sorority or fraternity right. and then they gave them a murder mystery and what they did with some of the teams was they injected new people in there from different sororities or fraternities and now all of a sudden that created discomfort in the process so the idea is fraternities all guys sororities all girls some teams mixed no but not the they they mixed not girls and guys. Okay. They put somebody from a different sorority right. in with that sorority. So it's still girls Dif and girls and guys and guys. Guys, right? right? But they put people from other, you know how they have like sister. And, yeah, sure. Right? And so there is a like-minded demographic that goes to a fraternity. Sure, and, absolutely. Right? And now they inject new people in. But what was most interesting was in the, this, the results was that how confidently the homogeneous groups presented their results thinking that they had aced it. Right. But in fact, the uh, the diverse team was tr more than twice as successful. So the homogeneous teams were successful 29% and the diverse team 60%. Wow. So it's, it's, it's huge. It's huge. Yeah. It, because it, in order to have growth, we have to go to that uncomfortable place. Yeah. We have, you know, we call it scratchy and emergency. Sure, yeah, yeah. But you have, you have to embrace the scratchy. And I think around leadership now, to lead new teams to innovation, that's what we need. That's we need to say, instead of saying, oh, that guy makes me feel uncomfortable, this feels scratchy. It's like, what is that telling me? Right. What do we have here? Is there something I need to learn from this situation? What's it? And um, so, so that's been a really, <coughs> excuse me, interesting and a dynamic for me. And I, I'm, I'm actually fascinated by it. Um, and I, I'll tell you, you know, if you go back, say, to, to my original, where I came from, I'm going to tell you another story. And when I came, so I came from that tiny town in rural Newfoundland. We, we didn't really have a lot of diversity. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I get it. So, you know, I um, 
And and I got to tell you, if you've ever seen Come From Away, that musical, it's not that we're Hicks. In that story, they feature an African American. You know the musical from Newfoundland, yeah, 9/11. I've, I've never seen it. But anyway, so <clears throat> the people that were diverse in that and the storylines they picked, it's about how they were treated. And um, anyway, so so even though it's um, pretty homogeneous, is a. Uh, um, Anyway, I like the way it was reflected. I wouldn't want anybody to think that Newfoundlanders were Hicks. Okay, <laughs> it's important, especially if my Got mother it. sees this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not Hicks. <laughs> Newfoundlanders, not Hicks. <laughs> but, uh, but when I came to Ontario, I, I wanted to proactively um, embrace immigration, um, the diversity. So I joined a group called Cultural Link. And um, it was to help immigrants integrate and assimilate into the community. And it was my proactive way to, to embrace my new reality. And when we entered the orientation, everybody came in as single people. It was very diverse, the faces around the table. And, um, and we had all arrived alone. Our first group activity, when we broke up, guess how we grouped ourselves? We grouped ourselves by color. Asians ended up at one table. Uh white people um, and and I was I was actually floored it was actually a profound um, experience in my life it was like how could this be I listened to people's objectives for being there right they were well-intended people right and the reason I tell you that is because it was really puzzling to me that these well-intended people who are there to embrace diversity diversity would break up and but it's not easy to do Right, so when we talk about cognitive diversity, yeah, we might know it intellectually, but I can guarantee you, if it's cognitively different, it feels abrasive, and we want to move to what we know, right. as opposed, even if we're well intended, comfort. even if it's well intended, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and and there's lots of research to support what happened in that cultural link division, right. um, that people do that. And, not so much when they're in tech teams, they've been working together for a while because well-intended people will cross over the barriers. But in new situations where it's stressful and you don't know what you're doing, and you're, you're going to gravitate to what you know. It's the neural pathway. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. But it was, it, it, it's interesting. So as I get to this place, it's like it all comes full circle. That's what it is. So we do naturally gravitate towards what we know and with cognitive diversity there is no visible way to recognize it well-intended people will get over will, will find ways to embrace visible diversity they right. will but we may not be able to do it as easily right. when it's our thinking does that make sense well it sounds like i mean i mean just with my experience with labor genetics when they when when people are together that think differently it can cause frustration if they don't know about how people think differently Right. But once we become aware of how people become, how people think differently, it becomes easier to understand the viewpoints and and understand that together there is an opportunity for more. So cognitive right. diversity being something we can't observe because it's happening between their ears, and then I mean visual diversity is a bit easier to see, but it's still kind of neural pathways that are created to make it so that we go to where we're comfortable. So I can completely understand that. Right. So if if with with physical that if you're coming with an open heart. Eventually, if you work together, of course you're going to come together in the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. And but you know, you may just say, "I don't like that guy," and not know why. Right. With cognition, unless you embrace it and go, "What is this teaching me? How do I lead this? How do I make sure I'm maximizing on people's strengths here?" So you've had an opportunity to work with all sorts of leaders, all sorts of teams. What's kind of one of the biggest common? challenges that leaders face and what they can do to kind of maybe take one step towards getting through it? So I think, um, you know, I think groupthink. I think um, hiring like um, like yourself because it there is something that naturally in that short period in the interview process that the people that resonate with you, you're not you're likely to hire them as opposed to the people that felt abrasive, right. especially in the, um, you know, in that situation with that shirt. So I would say spend the time uh, knowing your team and what do you need to add? Like, you know, if, if 10 people answer questions 
and um, eight of them answered them the same. Maybe hire the other two. Right. Right. The ones. So that why? Make, why is that? Like, why would you recommend? Them? Because the diversity, even though it feels uncomfortable, yields better results. Twenty-nine versus sixty. Right. So it's about embracing discomfort as opposed to avoiding it. So is there a fine line then in terms of, you know, strong positive culture and embracing the tension that comes along with diversity, not necessarily physical, but cognitive and mental diversity? Because, I mean, at some point... You have to gel. Yeah, like, you, I mean, you got to so, be team. So as a leader, we need to create psychological safety for everybody to be who they can in that. And so psycho I can't remember who coined the term, term out of Harvard, but it's, it's really, yes, of course you need to gel as a team, but it's really about the acknowledgement. So with, that's what you've done a really good job with that intrigue is people feel valued for where they sit. I hope so. On, you know, where <laughs> they sit on the continuum, right? And, and it's about creating psychological safety to, for failure. Because when you innovate like that, the uh, not every idea is going to be a success. Most but it's okay, right? But it's like seven out of ten fail. Yeah, easy, easy. Yeah. So, so you know, people have to be live in that where I can voice what I need to voice when I need to voice it. But I still have to rein it in to hear other perspectives. And um, but that's a whole other topic around psychological safety and uh, how leaders create that. So so you hire diversity, then create psychological safety for people to exist cohesively. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, uh, Simon Sinek does a really cool job of articulating psychological safety and leadership with Leaders Eat Last. I don't know if you had a chance to read that one. But, no. So, but from your perspective, what's one little tip people can use to create psychological safety for their team so they can get the most out of their people? So, you know, I had said this, but embrace, um, instead of um, feeling bothered by the scratchy, embrace it. As a leader, think about um, what it's telling you as opposed to how it feels. Because mm -hmm. you have, you leave a bigger emotional wake than your team members. The, bit, the higher your position, what you say and do impacts more. It's a bigger emotion. So, so you have more of a responsibility to embrace the scratchy than your employees. Right. So then, um, just to people that don't understand scratchy as a vocabulary and, and the tension that kind of exists for, for somebody if they're feeling that kind of uh, experience, can you kind of get specific in terms of an example of how that might come to life? Maybe where you've seen it happen to other people without naming names and stuff? Well, I, I actually... so. You know, in our profile, um, I've been around a boardroom where um, the, the a trimodal leader in our world, so three, yeah, yeah, the yeah, cognitive, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. was about to can the 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 guy who had led from his his non preference. Okay. Right, and so obviously, it, and the words were, "That guy just don't doesn't get me." Right. I am sick of trying to explain everything to him. Right. He asks too many questions, and I think it's time to let him go. Right. Right. So that can manifest that powerful, and it's like the group I told you about. It's not easy. It does feel that it can feel that scratchy sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It can feel that much discomfort. Um, but that's what I like about what you do at Intrigue, though, because once you neutralize it and you have information and data to support it. It's exactly that. You neutralize the conversation. Oh, and, and it has been magnificent for us. Like a real world scenario where to kind of support that example. And I think you know this story about Seth and I. Mm -hmm. um, so Seth Partridge, one of our long standing team members, longest standing team members, amazing individual, wired very differently than I am. And when, you know, four years ago, we would we'd be working on a project and I bring something new to the table so something that we've never done before and I'm like hey Seth because he used to help us build our, our, our template of services and how we went and scoped work and stuff like that and he still does and I'd say well, you know we're going to sell this to this client and then he's like well we don't do that I'm like yeah but that doesn't matter like we're we're going to do this I've got a clear vision of how we can make it happen he's like well I need this information and this detail and how's it going to happen when's it going to start and, and they give me this list I'm like 
I'll figure it out. Just get, it's two grand. Like, you know, yeah. like, just get out of my way. I'm like, man, why are you? Uh, and this frustration would occur and then realize after epigenetics that he's structurally oriented and also big picture thinker. And so I would then frame a message to him a little differently being like, Hey, you know, the big picture of the company, this idea is really going to help us, um, accomplish our vision. It's really going to help empower the purpose of the company. So I'm going to need your help with getting the details in place. I don't have them yet. But this is what we're going to be doing. Are you good with that? And he'd be like, Oh yeah, cool man. No problem. Yeah, exactly. So, and you <laughs> and might, the friction just has, was like gone. It, it, it's really, and it, it, it's authentically wanting to uh, connect in a real way with the person across the table. Oh, yeah. But it's it's really, it's not, it is easy once you know it. Once you know. Once you know it. Yeah. But I have a story about my son, too, because uh, he's a... He, I have total permission from him too. He's fourteen, and because uh, <laughs> okay. uh, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't, I would never want to not honor. Um, but he's a leads with his conceptual social, and in September, it's a big picture thinker, likes unusual ideas. In September, he was going to quit school and become a digital nomad. Right. Moved to Thailand. I said, "Well, what's a digital nomad?" He said, "Well, you can work from anywhere. If I move to Thailand, I can live for twelve thousand dollars a year, right? <laughs> and um, I can outsource cheap products from the factories there and resell it on Amazon." Yeah. And I said, "Well, buddy, it's probably not a bad idea, but you're in grade eight. You're, I'm not putting you on a plane to Thailand tomorrow." Yeah. But you know, he's this big picture. He loves travel. He thinks far ahead. How am I going to save money? He's doing his lifeguarding course now so he can get a good job to save money for travel. Cool. You know? And he's 14. But he's also, he, he's not really fond of school or likes school. He doesn't like it. And he, he keeps talking about this project-based learning and the value of project-based learning. And if you know, and and he's right. Like, the Scandin some Scandinavian countries who have far superior school systems to yeah. us. Yeah. That's what they do. And and Phil Jarvis, who heads a task force uh, to improve education, you know, Justin Trudeau, he talks about it. And so I get a call from the principal one day. He said, um, yeah, we've got this new project going on. It's um, robotics, numeracy, grade 7 numeracy attached to robotics. We think Daniel would be perfect for it. I was like, oh, yeah. oh this is so perfect. I said, I can't believe it. I said, did the teacher ask him? He said, yes. I said, what did he say? He said, I'm already overscheduled. <laughs> I said, let me talk to him. Yeah. I'll get back to you. Now, I knew the, the, the uh, teacher's perspective it was different. So when he got in the car, knowing his profile, I said, okay, bud, I got to talk to you. Your principal called today. He said, ah, what about? I said, um, there's a brand new, pi only two pilots in Halton. Right. You know, you talk about project-based learning. It's attaching numeracy to robotics. He said, mom, can I be a part of that? <laughs> I said, that's why he called, sweetie. Yeah. And it was that simple, the language, because he, that's all he needed to know. That's was, awesome. Yeah, and, and he, he did the program. He enjoyed it, but, but it was really in the positioning. That's all I had to say. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. It's, yeah, and, and it always goes back to this uh, age-old adage, right? It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Yeah, and, and it's, ha uh, you know, it's the old... Um, do unto others, but do unto others as they want. Done. Yeah, yeah. because our perspective, rule. that's the platinum rule. And because we all come at it from our own perspective and we need to pull ourselves out, and especially as leaders. The higher we are, the more responsibility we have to do it. Yeah, big time. Thanks for doing this. Well, that was a hoot. I forgot I was on camera. <laughs> you crushed it. That was great. <laughs> all right, bye, guys. <laughs>